Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Cast. As I am here joined by a very special guest, Anthony Ciardelli, who does a totally offsides podcast on the Anaheim Decks. Definitely check him out over there as we're going to talk all things Ducks. As they are first in the Pacific Division, well ahead of where they thought they would be on the rebuild. So we'll get into why that's the case. And we'll get into some of the division foes like the Flames and Vegas Golden Knights. Even the Sharks that are a surprise team in their own right and where we think that those teams stock up against the Anaheim Book. But first and foremost, Delhi, how are you doing? And also love the um, stuff you got now before you just had the regular old headsets when we were on like two years ago starting this. Now you got this all pro uh, setup. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got the uh, microphone covering half my face, but uh, it's kind of it's not one of those ones that picks up uh, volume from far away. So I kind of got to get close to it. But uh, yeah, thank you. It's it's been good. I'm happy to be on. Thanks for having me Um, have an office now that looks more professional than my room where I was most of the time doing pods (laughs) with you and and uh, Perlo. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm happy to happy you guys are having me. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's always awesome to have you on. It's always awesome to be talking about, one, the West in general, but two, uh, this Ducks team in general that's been really fun to watch uh, this year through ESPN+. Plus. used to watch it through NHL TV. Now it's switched over. Um, but it, it, they've been very fun to watch. I would start first and foremost uh, with the fact that Trevor Zegras and Sonny Milano, we talked about it before the podcast, that when he, Milano went to the Ducks, even before Zegras was up, it seemed like he was kicking into a little bit of a different gear and getting going. But now with Trevor, it's like that Crosby, Sheary, or like it seems like they're getting towards like that. Just They have that snap of the finger chemistry like Crosby, Connor, Sheary, or Crosby, Kunitz had. Uh, what's your take on the way that that line is really just coming into its own? Really because of those two players. Not that Raquel, Raquel's playing fine, but those two are just skyrocketing and playing so great together. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think I wrote it on Twitter a few like a month or so ago that uh, Sonny Milano, I think, owes Trevor Zegers quite a few steak dinners because he saved his career. Um, even we're talking like we like you said we were talking about uh, Milano kind of being revived with the Ducks, but it w- it really wasn't until this season they put him on waivers. Like I think at the end of training camp or right towards the end, uh, before they knew what type of chemistry he and Zegers had, and and obviously everyone. Any every any hockey fan around the nation saw that goal that Zegers did to Michigan and kind of tapped it over. Awesome. Then yeah, that was the, quite the highlight. But they've they've had some really good chemistry the whole season, and it's something that I think uh, along with Troy Terry, who we'll probably get into in a little bit, uh, has really given the Ducks a big boost, specifically on the power play. We talk about how the Ducks have have really surprised a lot of people in terms of where they are. Everyone thought probably they'd be a bottom five team in the league. And uh, they're at the top of the Pacific vision. Uh, We'll get into this a little bit later too. I think they're probably somewhere in between. Uh, I don't really think they're a a top of the division type team when it's all said and done, but I do think they're going to be a playoff bubble team. But uh, that is really in large part due to their power play and their penalty kill. And when you have somebody like Sonny Milano and somebody like Trevor Zegers with uh, with the chemistry they have, Opponents really have to cover multiple options. It's not like you can just focus on the one spot in the uh, face-off circle where people do one-timers or wherever an offense might want to focus its power play through. You've got multiple options now that you have to cover, and that's opened up a lot of space and, and a lot of uh, opportunities for other players on the Ducks on the power play. And and when you talk about their power play last year, which was historically bad, some websites have it as the worst power play of all time, like in, in wow. the history of the NHL. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, it was like 8%, and now I think they're top 10. I want to say maybe they're fifth in the league. I wrote it down somewhere uh, in power play percentage, and I think that has a lot to do with, with uh, Milano and Zegras, just the skill that they have and, and the ability that they have to, to vary up their kind of the face of the attack. And, and with Zegras, where he can pass and his deception, I mean, it, it really – he really seems to be the key along with Milano to their power play success and overall their team success. Yeah. And then uh, the other two people you mentioned, it's kind of a four headed monster uh, with this ducks team as far because gets labs really um, he's been good his entire, he's never had a very bad season his entire group of 36 years old. I have five points under a points per game. I mean, he's completely rejuvenated with a uh, Terry uh, who's become a steal of the 2015 draft um, on that line and also being a good power play contributor uh, they seem like they kind of have that that gelling with each other as well um, 
what do you think of those two together and kind of how the, they complete that four-headed monster of the Zegris, Milano, Terry, and then you have Ryan Getzlaff, the veteran there that's the captain that's stuck through everything, and now he's coming out on top again, and it looks like you're going to have more winning seasons with him around. Yeah, well, on the power play, whether you put them on the same unit or two individual units, it really does give you uh, different modes of attack, like I said. But it also, on five-on-five, five gives you two really strong top two lines, which is which is really important. I mean, it's better than you can say for teams like the Bruins right now, who, who are really top-heavy and, and surprisingly have less points overall in the NHL than the Ducks do. So that right there is important. But I think the funny thing that really goes to show just how bad they were previously was – Getzlev has always been the engine of the Ducks. Like he, he's he been, when he's doing well, the Ducks are doing well. But one thing the Ducks just didn't have over the past few seasons was a, was a finisher. They just had, didn't have anyone that could take those Getzlev passes and put them in the back of the net. Oh, <laughs> my daughter's just coming in. Uh, just give me one second. <laughs> okay, sure. Daddy's working. It's okay. Wait, no. uh, <laughs> a little bit. She came in from the park. Sorry. Um, no, that's fine. Um, Anyway, so you have all those great passes from uh, from Getzlav that weren't getting put in the back of the net, and and really now with both with Zegers and Milano and specifically Terry, they have somebody who can do that. Now here's where I would caution Ducks fans a little bit. Terry has been on fire. I mean, he he's 17 goals or something, which is more than any player in the Ducks scored through 56 games last season. I think he's four or five points away from the uh, the season leader last year in points for which was Comtois. Uh, through 56 games, and he's played 20, or they played 30. So, and I think Terry's been scratching a few, so we'll call it like 26 or 27. So, uh, it's really, and that was before, obviously, he caught fire. But his shooting percentage is 25%, <laughs> which is not sustainable. I mean, nobody basically for their career goes, uh, or a full season really goes. Uh, other than maybe a veteran. Like, other than oh, maybe, yeah. Well, I mean, for one year, maybe, but I, I, I looked it up just to get a comparison. So, Career-wise, Gretzky's shooting percentage was for his career was 17.6. Ovechkin shoots a lot more, I think, than than a lot of them. 12.8 percent for his career. Oh, and, oh and, wow! And uh, Drysaitel, who's right behind Terry in shooting percentage this season, I think at 21 or 24 something. The most he's ever done in a season is 21 point something. So 25 is really. <laughs> Is not, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. So everything he's shooting is going in. He is also leading the Ducks in shots. So once you add up the high amount of shots and the high percentage of success, you're going to get a lot of goals. So do I think Troy Terry is going to end up <laughs> this season or this career with the shooting percentage of 25% and finish with 50, 60 goals? No. But is he better than he was when he came into the league and over the past few years where he was struggling? Definitely. I think Terry is going to be, I mean, with his confidence and it's a little bit of a uh, a sad thing that Getzlav is at the end of career, his career and just kind of finding his his chemistry with Terry. But um, I think the confidence that Terry has and the willingness to shoot, which was something he really wasn't doing in the past, has really helped him. So is he is he going to continue at this pace? No. But is he going to be able to help the Ducks uh, and be a, a top goal scorer on this team for maybe the next whoever knows how long I, th- I think so i think he can definitely be a, a much bigger contributor than he has in the past just not quite this much <laughs> yeah yeah i mean when you're on this ridiculous of a pace obviously we have to put it in perspective i mean when you're a fifth round pick though i think what you highlighted it, it, sometimes you have to get through the bumps and bruises that and then once you get through them you're a guy that has that mentality of you never were guaranteed a spot like the percentage is once you get past the second round diminish drastically in you even making it to the league and as a draft pick so the fifth round is probably like in the low teens if it's even that high of a percent chance of of you making it i would have to imagine so like the he the fact that he's turning into what he's turning into um if he can be an all-star level player for a fifth round pick that's a, that's a definitely a steal of the draft and and um it looks like that's the way that it's trending um somebody though on the forward core that's been around the Ducks for a while, obviously, um, that you guys have the 2024 that's kind of just turned into the defensive uh, wizard now on the penalty kill that fits in nicer with this team, where before I think he got more crap because you didn't have, like, the scorer, like you said, is uh, Silverberg as a defensive wizard now. What do you think on uh, his game now as he's kind of just at the age of 31 developed his game? He used to score more of the 20 goals here and there. Now he's more of just, you're not scoring against me. 
I'm going to shut down the guy that I have to go against nine times out of ten type of guy, and then her chip in assists here and there only has one goal on the season this far. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to show kind of the attitude that he has and why uh, before he, he was relieved of his duties, uh, the GM, Bob Murray, loved him so much, and I think why a lot of the players like him. He, he's like a Patrice Bergeron light. Obviously, he doesn't score quite as much, but he's he's a good leader. He's willing to take on the role that you give to him, and I think you recognized back when the team wasn't so offensively potent that he was the one who was going to have to be relied upon to, to score a lot more. And now that they've got these young guys who can score, he says, you know what, I'm going to sit back and, and concentrate more on my defense. And, and that's been great for the Ducks. Like, like you said, their, their penalty kill is up there, up there with, I think, in the top 10 of the league uh, and doing really well with another Swede, Isaac Lundestrom, who's become really a, a good penalty killer. So, I mean, it props to Jacob Silverberg or Jacob Silverberg for, uh, for just his kind of versatility and his ability to play the role that he's assigned. I mean, that's important, especially for young players to see that a guy will take on what he, what he needs to take on. And, and for him specifically to be able to focus on defense, I think has helped the ducks a lot because they have been on top of their, uh, their lack of offense. They, they really struggled on defense in previous seasons and, and inability to clear people in front of the net and cover people in front of the net. And I don't know, I think that had a little bit to do with Eakins' inexperience as well. He, he Up until this season, he hasn't really coached defensively that well, even in Edmonton. But now they're slowly but surely turning the tide, and I think part of that goes to Silverberg's uh, better focus and better ability to not have to worry about doing so much on the ice. Because uh, I think he led the Ducks a couple of years ago in points the season before last. So he really has demonstrated that he he's willing to do whatever is needed of him. Uh, and, and that, that whole offensive thing too, I mean, we'll get in, maybe get into this in a bit too, but the, the, <laughs> the offense, the defense by offense sort of method that the ducks have been employing where they've just been spending so much more time in the offensive zone at five on five hasn't, uh, has resulted in them not really having to defend as much. And I think that's kind of helped, helped out, uh, the defense a lot compared to previous seasons. No, that's a good point. They do have a very good with Eakins this year. And I think obviously having, uh, Drysdale up and playing all 30 this year uh, helps with that push the pace up the ice uh, from your defense because he's fantastic at that um, and then obviously Cam Fowler's having a very good assist uh, driven season with like four goals so um, you mentioned though Ludus from two I think this is the year obviously different guys take different times to really uh, break it in where 23 20- Four to 27 is usually when I consider when you first enter your prime years, depending who you are in between there. He's at 22 and already looking like a very good defensive player with 15 points. I think his progression is definitely a very positive with how um, good he's moving along this far. Yeah, absolutely. Lundestrom looks good, and, and he showed flashes. It's crazy. I mean, the Ducks kind of got this reputation for – having been developing their young draft picks for a long time in the AHL, which they, I mean, they, they did do also, but in, in the most recent kind of last few years, a lot of those first rounders, Lundstrom, I think was their first over, first round pick in 2018. I want to say uh, straight to the NHL for a few games, at least to show what you can do. He played, I think, let's see here, 15 games. No. Uh, yeah. 15 games in his first NHL season, right after he was drafted in 2018 same went for uh, uh, who was that for McTavish, who, who was up here for a few games a season. So and now on the World Junior team too. So he's yeah. going to get a lot of good experience. Yeah, was so, playing great for Peterborough too when he went down. So yeah, absolutely, he was lighting it up. So uh, what were we t- so I think that that the ability for the Ducks to have these young players like Lundstrom come up and take to the NHL right away, kind of get a couple experiences, and then basically land as a full-time player maybe a couple of years in uh, and really be right there, ready to do what they need to do and, and mature, uh, has really helped this team bounce back faster than I think a lot of people thought they would, especially when you compare that with the Kings, <laughs> which uh, it's funny. I was thinking about it back in the last few seasons when you read a lot of draft experts, I think like Corey Pronman and, and some of those the prospect guys, we're really touting both the Kings and the Ducks, but consistently I think they rank the Kings system a little bit ahead of the Ducks. I wonder if they still feel the same way about it, because if you look at who the who the Kings have had, and obviously they've had some injuries and they're they're still competing in, in within striking range of a playoff spot, but look at guys that they drafted when they were kind of on the way down, like Velarde and Jared Anderson Dolan are 
not really lighting it up in the AHL. Some of them have had injury problems, but they're they're not really those type of players that that are contributing early on in their careers. For Velarde, they just moved a wing to try to find uh, his niche there because you have Turcotte and uh, what's his name uh, Byfield down the center position, so you're not going to need him at center as much. So. Yeah, and Turcotte's another guy. Uh, Byfield obviously just coming back from an injury, only playing a couple games in the AHL so far, and they're hoping to get him back, but. Turcotte was a guy they drafted fifth overall, four spots in front of where the Ducks drafted Zegers in, in 2019, I think it was. And maybe, yeah, it was 2019. And Turcotte playing well in the AHL, but not lighting it up like you. He's not dominant down there. And for, for a, a number five overall pick, yeah, maybe it takes a little while for him, to, longer for him to develop than it does some of the other guys. And it's definitely not too early to give up on him yet. Absolutely not. I <laughs> can't do that. But uh, it's a little concerning that he hasn't, really been as dominant as some of the guys in his draft year that are now full-time NHL players like Zegris and Dylan Cousins, uh, ignoring the top two guys who I think what was that Jack Hughes and uh, Kako were those the two guys from their year one and two or uh, yeah. Kako. Yeah. He was in Kako. Kako. And those guys obviously were top two overall. Yeah. Both of those guys are also injuries holding them, holding them back. Like you mentioned with some of those guys uh, having injuries, holding them back. That's that's Kako. He has the skill. Hughes has the skill, uh, the injuries. Uh, Turcotte, I always thought that when they drafted him, like he was great in the world juniors, but that's because he's playing his age and and he has the skill to be great there. I kind of thought he was one of those guys that had to grow his game to the pro level a little bit longer than someone like, Trevor, who also kind of has that fun to watch energy and confidence to him, where like you just know as soon as he clicks at the AHL, he's just immediately going to think, okay, screw this, I'm ready to go to. Well, the- like as soon as like it clicks in for him there, it's going to be like, okay, I'm ready for the next thing. Like yeah. he's one of he's one of those guys where whenever you see those types of players and you draft them, those that's why like if I was a GM, if I saw that type of personality. When I interviewed somebody, that would immediately be the person I want to drift because I would know as soon as they figure it out, they would know that they're want to, they're ready to be up and have that. They're good. I have the butterflies like everybody has, but they'll be a lot more confident when they first come up. If you have that personality, even if you have all the skill, rather than someone that has to gel into the league for a couple weeks because he has that more nervous personality that you have to like adjust a little bit. Like having someone like Zegras you have more of a like expectation that he is just going to jump in right away because he has that just um basically contagious confidence. Yeah, to, yeah, alpha dog confidence to him that's contagious around the team. Like Getzlaff had for his entire career, he has that like, don't worry guys, I got this type of like vibe to him. Yeah, yeah, it's really been fun to see Zegers not just kind of shake up the ducks but shake up kind of what the league expects out of a player when they talk to the media and what the emotions they show on the ice the other day they had that little back and forth with uh with uh Voracek and Colum- against Columbus when uh Zegers had that ridiculous did I say Zegers I meant Zegers if I said Milano earlier um where Zegers had that ri- another ridiculous goal where he just got on the uh was it a shootout or was it I think it was a shootout where he comes in wide kind of really nonchalant and kind of bears down keeps the puck on his forehand and just whips it right past the goalie, I think five hole. Oh, and yeah, looked, yeah, the five hole goal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that was and, a shootout. Yeah. And he goes right past the Columbus bench and starts jawing at them. And then Voracek scores and comes back the other way past the Ducks bench. That's like, that's the type of thing that it will draw more fans into the NHL. That type of, that, that attitude. And I just think it's, a, a refreshing thing to see from from Zegers, as long as he knows where to, where to rein it in and where not to. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you got to know where to where to t- hold it. You don't want to go to the like I like guys that show that confidence and spunk, but um, you have to know how to rein it in. You don't want to go to like the overabundant uh, level there, which he hasn't. So no, so yeah. far, yeah, yeah, so far so good for him. Definitely when it comes to that energy and when it comes to his play but we definitely have to move in because you talked about the defense a big reason other than the obvious of Lindholm Drysdale forming a good line Fowler's staying healthy and playing well this year Manson so far staying healthy and playing well this year together as well but I think a big thing on the defense is Shannon Kirk was for a lack of a better word pitiful like he was not good and then this season he's all of a sudden back to being Kevin Shattenkirk and even when he's been with uh, Benoit who 
I think, like, when I remember when I read about him when he got called up, uh, some people thought, oh, crap, well, maybe he's not fully ready to be up yet, the undrafted kid. And he's actually looked solid in 16 games for um, having that tag. He played a couple last year and has been very good for San Diego. So um, I feel like when you see that, too, and you see guys come in that always just, that fit in immediately, that's when you know you're clicking all the bells right. Because when you're a lineup, like you've seen it with Barubi with the Blues before. You saw it with Sutter when he had the King. You're seeing it with the Ducks now where you have guys like Buddy Robinson coming in for a couple games and playing well, who's been a career AHLer. Uh, you have Ben Woe, who some people thought was premature call-up, playing very solid in six games. That's when you know you're pushing the buttons right. Stolars is a fantastic backup since going there, and I still believe in Dostal as a goaltender. He's only 21. Um, so I think your defense and the way that um, everything is just clicking on this team is really moving in the right direction, but particularly with the defense, other than the obvious of Drysdale as a great youngster, who's somebody that really sticks out to you with how they've been playing this year for the Ducks defense? Shattenkirk is definitely one of them, Shattenkirk and Fowler. Uh, I think just as a as a defensive core, it's amazing how <laughs> – just how bad they were in previous seasons. And you really realize that that isn't as much to do with their uh, collective skill level. Because when you think about guys like Lindholm and Fowler and Shattenkirk, that, that should be a really good, consistent defensive core. And I think would be on a, in the previous seasons on a competitive team. But just how much of a relief I think it is for them that they don't spend their entire game in the defensive zone because that's just exhausting. Getting behind the net, getting ground down by the forecheck, blocking shots, chasing the puck around the zone, that is exhausting to do for an entire game. And the fact that they can now spend some time out on the blue line, skate up the ice with the offense, really just kind of rest their mind and their body a little bit on the point, I mean... It, it's it sounds ridiculous that they're back there like sitting they call it sitting in a rocking chair almost but just not having to do the hard grunt work in the defensive zone quite so often has made them I think that much better and that much more able to play up to their previous standard and the same goes for defending in front of the net they, they haven't gotten that much better over the past few seasons defending the what we call high high danger chances in front like high danger scoring chances. It's still about the same as it was in, in previous seasons when it comes to the chances that they're allowing, but their percentage has gone way down. You know, I mean, for those who don't know high danger scoring chances, they're basically the chances that are off the rush or off rebounds very close into their, uh, into the goal. And they, they kind of calculate the percentage that you give up versus the percentage that you generate. And this year, finally, the ducks are at, I think a 44, 51.81 Corsi four number or, um, High, dan- high danger chances for number, which means that they're generating more chances in front of their opponent's net than they're giving up. And compared to where that was last season, which is, I think it was 48.9 uh, up to 51.81 now, it's just, uh, or am I getting it wrong? Yeah, 12, yeah. So um, it just that time that they're not, that they don't have to spend in the defensive zone has really helped them defend close in front of the net and I think giving them more energy and help guys like Shattenkirk and Fowler and Lindholm play better overall. Yeah, no, yeah, I think it definitely has because I think something we don't talk about enough, you hear some podcasters talk about it and some people on TV is how much the forward core affects the defensive core because if you have a bunch of defenders or forwards, excuse me, that aren't and exiting the neutral zone well and entering the offensive zone well, resulting in the defense having to make plays and run around like chickens with no head all the time, that's going to result in your defense looking poorer than the skill level actually should result in them looking like you just mentioned, where now that you have guys like Zegris, you have Terry, like you mentioned, you have Milano, you have even guys like Raquel um, entering the zones better, Ludestrom, and everybody's getting there and getting it across and making quick poise and pace level decisions. Uh, you're moving quicker and keeping the puck in your zone. That uh, always positively impacts your defense, where sometimes we don't talk about enough how important the forward group is when we kind of destroy teams' defenses for how bad they are. We don't talk about always how much the forward group means to how bad that defense group is. Like with the Flyers on their 10-game losing streak, the forward group was pitiful at, at entering the neutral zone and entering the offensive zone. It's been better in the last three on the on the winning streak, but 
like you, you that really is going to make your defense look significantly worse, and your goaltending at times looks significantly worse because you're going to be hung out to dry because your defense looks significantly worse. Yeah, where I mean, this year Gibson looks like the old Gibson too, and and he never did necessarily didn't. It's just he didn't have the numbers of the old Gibson because of what you just said. You had volume. guys running around, and you weren't playing as concise of a systematically as you are this year, where now everything's coming together with everybody fitting into their spot perfectly, basically. Yeah, you nailed it there with the with the possession. I mean, the Ducks have much higher skill level on their forward core, which means when they're taking those breakout passes from their defensemen, they're maintaining possession of the offensive zone, setting up an attack. The defensemen can stop at the blue line, kind of be more deliberate with what they're doing, receive passes, make passes, and, and set up an attack. Versus you think about the old dump and chase method, a lot of times defense would come skate out of their zone. They'd have to get up closer to the offensive zone to maintain those gaps once the rush started back the other way. But once you're dumping it in, if the other team is able to pick it up, break it right back out without any real forecheck. Those defensemen are skating basically from behind their goal line back to the blue line or past the red line, then getting right back on their horse and getting back into the zone. That's those are wind sprints, and if you're doing that the whole game, it's not uh, it's not really a, a recipe for success. No, and, and what you just said is why I hate like some people are like, oh, well, Dolphin Chase has been going on for so long and it's been working. Like a lot of people here in Philly, they're like, well, Philly's done it and it's worked with other teams. I'm like. That's great. I don't care that it's worked with other teams. This is the here and now, and it's not working with this team because it's not the system that this team should be running. And really, in today's game, most teams should be running because it's not at nearly as effective as it was back in back in um, even like ten to twelve years ago. Not even just back in the day in hockey, but like even then, you could even argue seven years ago because now it's the quick make the quick decision. You don't even you you want to have a quick skating team, but if you're not the quick skating team, like you're like the blues that have some quick skaters but mix in guys that are just good skaters like the O'Reilly's and Shens of the world, you're a good pace team. Like and that's what you see nowadays. Dump and chase doesn't normally equal great pace. Mm -hmm. Because you're you're literally chasing the puck like you just said. So uh that's why I feel like that system nowadays is one of the dumber ones to run. <laughs> and that's also why I think A V got fired from uh, Philadelphia because we got too reliant on a dump and chase when you don't have players like what the hell are you trying to have Cam Atkinson do dump and chase systems for Cam Atkinson is one of the better players in the league at entering the zone so it, it didn't make sense where um, I'm happy to see the Ducks though because they are last year um, they were w with um, guys coming together like you said you mentioned Comtois who's been out um, this year, but uh, him coming together, you also have Jones there who's been out this year too, but they always kind of had that inkling like they were a fun team to watch because you had the youngsters that were fun to find. You're like, it's here, it's a couple years, or it's, and then you were thinking a couple years, now it's, you jump to this year. So since you jumped to this year and it being successful this year, who do you think in the Pacific Division at this point um, I think I know who you're going to say, but who do you think would be the biggest threat to the Anaheim Ducks if they do want to surprise people all the way and be like the San Francisco Giants out there in California and take it all the way to the top and actually win this division? I mean, it, I was thinking about this before. You almost, looking looking at the Pacific Division, have no better an idea now what it's going to look like come playoff time than you did when the season started. Because you have the teams like Anaheim who are surprising people, Calgary, which weirdly, I think Calgary might be the most, besides Vegas. Vegas had a lot of injuries, started the season, didn't play so well. Now they're kind of on the up and up. What are they, 6-4 and four in their last last 10 games? So they're making their way back up the standings, which is which is where, P or, yeah, 6-4, and four, last 10, yep. Yeah. Um, one, one, two games in a row. They've got Stone back. They've got, uh, I think, Pacioretty's back now. Uh, yeah, he's been playing. You. Yeah, so they so they've got guys now who are coming back. They've got Eichel who might be able to play by the by March. So that's a big boost. So Vegas, obviously, I think is the one team that you know is going to be there at the end. Calgary, surprisingly, seems like the most consistent team in the division besides the Ducks so far. And they've they've had good goaltending both from Vladar and Markstrom. Uh, Goudreau's back to his old tricks. You've got you've got um, Tuchuk playing playing really well. So I think. Calgary is is one of the teams that'll be there at the end, and then everyone else is kind of hard to tell. Anaheim, I think I think they're not what they've shown so far this season, sadly, but they are definitely a playoff bubble team and a div division like the Pacific now. 
Uh, I think they should get in, judging by where they've started. They're beating the teams that are worse than them, the non-playoff teams, consistently, and they're competing against the good teams. I, I think that I think that puts them in a in a maybe a wild card spot or a bottom maybe number three spot in the Pacific. Edmonton, <laughs> their they're, defense is terrible. They've always been terrible, and, it, and it, it's like. How many years are you going to go through this with knowing that you've got McDavid and Dreisaitl as your basically your entire team, and you just have a bad defense? You start off hot and then it's losing six in a row. I watched the game against the Bruins the other night where they they were under. I mean, the Bruins were under siege, but at a certain point, if the only guys they can put the puck in the net are McDavid and Dreisaitl, I mean, that's not gonna that's not gonna win you playoff games for sure. <laughs> And it's going to be tough to to get through a full 82 game season. I think Edmonton probably still pulls out a playoff spot after their nosedive that they've been in, uh, and so that probably leaves on the bubble. I'd say the Ducks, Edmonton, and and one or two of the Kings and the Sharks. One of those two, I think, probably better chance that it's the Sharks, considering the guys that they have still on their roster and Carlson and Burns. I think the Kings, with Byfield coming back, will will threaten, but I think it's a little too late for them. Sean Walker, losing Sean Walker was a huge blow. So, uh, Yeah, that's I, an ACL and MCL, too. That's not going to be easy to come back from. No, and with his type of game, I, I think really the only two teams that are totally out of it, and even this is a stretch to say with the way that Vancouver's played since they've got Boudreaux, won five in a row. I don't think Vancouver is got what it takes really and seattle there's no chance i mean i called seattle a glorified ahl team before the season uh they've been a little better in their last 10 but i just don't see that roster competing for a playoff spot even the pacific division so i think you can make it a lock that vegas is going to get in i think calgary probably going to get in then you've got i say not quite a lock but pretty good chance that anaheim and edmonton get in and then from there i mean it would take the, the central really crapping the bed and not taking one of those wild card spots, but Kings and Sharks have an or Sharks have an outside chance, I, I think. Yeah, no, yeah, I would agree with that because right now it's uh, Nashville and um, Edmonton for the uh, wild card spot. It says as I look that up, but I think your team has the much better. Obviously, not think I know your team has the much better defense than the uh, Edmonton Oilers, where the Kings. Their defense has just been destroyed because everybody's been going in and out of that lineup and the injuries have been destroying their entire defense, including the people that have gone in and out on the forward core that are more 200 feet or defenders. Um, so uh, that has a big factor. The Sharks, the Sharks are a surprise team, but the Sharks are also fantastic due to a former ECHL or himself that played a couple games here in Reading. Uh, James Reimer uh, having a fantastic... <laughs> Uh, season this far where they're playing good and playing better defensively but they're still allowing a few too many high octane chances where if hill and reimer have like those little lull periods that every goal he has it'll be interesting to see what the sharks do in those moments where i still think your team's playing a better complete the ducks are playing a better complete through and through obviously defense to offense game i think the biggest threat of a team that's currently outside um looking in roster wise would be if Bruce Boudreaux's Canucks can make it up just because of the actual people they have. Like you have Pedersen, you have Bess, you have like all these guys. Miller. Miller. Yeah, that that really affect the team. Uh, OEL when he's back, that he looks a little bit better in games. Yeah, Demko's one of the best goaltenders of late in the league. Um, So, I mean, I think that's going to play a factor if they can keep going. But in terms of the second best threat, until the Oilers add defense, if the Sharks keep playing good this year and add and decide to go, well, we're ahead of where we thought we were also, and not like mortgage anything, but add like getting the guys that are on rentals so you don't have to pay that much for them trade wise. If they decide to do that, th- you might have some pretty pissed off Oilers fans because they might end up <laughs> getting knocked out of the damn wild card by the San Jose Sharks. But <laughs> like, like, because like with the way they're playing this year, their game of overall impresses me way more than Edmonton. Edmonton's run so much through the power play where they have a little bit more like Nuge is a very good assist guy. Pool Yarvi is actually getting points now, but beyond that, Yamamoto's stepped back a little bit, um, and like you're not having as much 
stuff getting going there, and you haven't found any depth. You're, you're one of the worst. De- when you look at their numbers for bottom six, like goals expected, they're always one of the worst teams. So it's not just defense. It's bottom six play consistently being poor is a big reason why I don't consider the Edmonton Warriors that big of a threat because it's a shame since Miko Koski finally has actually stepped up for you in more of a degree than you would ever expect. Now you have all this crap hitting the fan <laughs> that – is not going to get it going if you're an Oilers fan. Plus, uh, we wish everybody well in Edmonton and Alberta because Calgary's going through it. They have all the COVID issues going on with it. When Tibbet, I saw, went into protocol post game uh, yesterday. So yeah, yeah, it's it's really the division is such a mix up now. It's it is really hard to tell who's going to who's going to be there when it comes down to the uh, the end of the season. But I mean, the Ducks. Getting back to the Ducks, they compared to what was expected of them, which was bottom three lottery team, probably down there along with the Sabres and and the Kraken. First in the Pacific Division is unbelievable, but even competing for a playoff spot until March, April, it's that's going to be such a such a <laughs> a relief for Southern California and hockey fans and Ducks fans because it's like there's been nothing to cheer for for like three years since since uh, the Ducks got eliminated by. What was it the Sharks and then the Kings got eliminated by the Golden Knights in that in that same 2018 playoff? It was like it's been crap from then on. So uh, at least some some competitive spring hockey would be nice. No, I agree. And also, if you can get in, it's always when you get those young guys that cup of coffee in the playoffs. It don't matter how deep it goes. But also, you got John Gibson with those young guys, so that could be a team that can threaten to go a little bit deeper too than one would expect. Um, but it doesn't matter because you're just getting the playoff experience and that's going to help those guys in tenfold that when you get there and you're actually really ready and have the deep tool you roster where you fill it out completely and grab the guys like the Lightning did or you see the Avalanche grab to complete the piece of the puzzle for the uh, cup contending roster. You're going to have the experience already rather than having that be only like the second time they make the playoffs or something like that. If you start making it this year, make it next year, you're building up to that. You that just always helps and helps these guys really be confident to just jump in and be the same guy they are in the regular season and the postseason so you don't see any step backs there. But I think as we're um, ending towards the wrap up here, uh, there's two things I wanted to ask you. One would be what are guys on the team? Obviously, you want to see continue to do what they're doing and continue to progress. And then who are some guys if the Ducks want to stay where they're at? that you think have to maybe, if there are any, pick it up a little bit so that this team can continue to stay at the pace they're at and try to be at least in the top three, if not the surprise as a whole, like the Giants were, where they were able to just win the entire division over the mighty uh, Dodgers, where you might be able to win the division over the mighty Knights uh, if you're able to do it here. So, Yeah. Uh, obviously, Raquel is a guy that the Ducks have been waiting to kind of resume his his past success for a long time and he's he's had fits and starts of it this season but if he really can maintain that consistency that'd be great jamie drysdale uh has i mean predictably in his first full professional season has been okay but he could be doing better 13 assists and in, in 30 games is is good for a first basically a rookie uh but he he has shown some some inexperience and, and had some a, a few learning <laughs> growing pains uh, but if you, if you're talking about the way the ducks are going right now, their first two lines are, are playing really well. You're going to need that, that bottom kind of third line to start scoring, which means Sam Steele needs to, cause he's been probably the most disappointing young ducks player, uh, in the last three or four years, Sam Steele's going to need to really pick it up, uh, and, and look a lot better. And then <laughs> people love this in Anaheim. Uh, he's, he's gone from like the cute, uh, kind of, um, fan favorite to the whipping boy, Derek Grant. Uh, Mm -hmm. people just, people just (laughs) hate on Derek Grant now. And Eakins has this thing where he, he likes to put Grant up through the lineup. I mean, if we're being honest, Grant's probably a, a good third, fourth liner, but he ends up last season. He got some power play minutes. He'll play some first line minutes or second when somebody's injured. So, uh, he doesn't belong on the first and second line, but if he can, if he can kind of score or produce at the rate he was a couple of years ago, 
where I think he was on track to have a career best season. Then he got traded to Philly uh, and, and played, I think, pretty well, right? I mean, he was he was In the regular good. season, he played well. Yeah, he didn't go cold until the postseason, like the actual postseason, like that bubble yeah. postseason. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if I think if Grant can pick it up and if Sam Steele can kind of look like he has been expected to look and not like he is uh, looking, then uh, I think the Ducks are in really good shape. Delorier has been playing pretty well. Henrique has played pretty well since being put on waivers last year. <laughs> so uh, it really it's funny. One of the guys I do the podcast with, uh, his name is Khalid. Uh, he he calls Kevin, uh, sorry, Adam Henrique waiver guy. He wore a jersey. <laughs> With Adam <laughs> Henrique's no, a custom jersey with Adam Henrique's number on it, and then I think uh, had Waiver Guy instead of Henrique on his on his uh, <laughs> nameplate, and got on TV, got on the Ducks broadcast. So that's pretty oh, funny. Nice. So if Waiver Guy can continue to p- play consistently, yeah. That well, would speaking be, of him, great. Uh, what's it? What's the status on Henrique? Because isn't he banged up? Uh, as of now, I think he is. I think he's. I think he's week to week. Let's see. What does it say on Hockey Reference? Uh, did not play Thursday's game. That was December 9th. So, yeah, he's, he's probably week to week. Or, or is he on IR? He's not on IR. So I think he'll be back soon, hopefully. Okay. And then what about uh, the last thing would be, because you talked about Steele not living up to his quota yet. Well, you also picked, I think, Com- was Comtra in the same draft as Steele? Or, or was not Comtra. Was Jones in the same draft as Steele? Uh, I think Steele was the year... Um, that's a good question. I think Steel Steel and J- Jones oh, were the same see. were the same year. Yeah, 20, they were. Yeah, here yeah. it is. Yeah. Thirtieth pick was Steel and then twenty a little bit before him, uh twenty fourth was Jones. But like yeah. those guys were I saw like it was six weeks originally for come twice five for Jones or how how many weeks is that at now? Is that a couple weeks now? Is it still about five to six weeks? I think it's probably, well, it says four to six months now for Jones. That was the beginning of October. So, I mean, you're looking at end of the season if he gets back because the pectoral muscles. Steel is, Steel is playing. Uh, I think he's in and out of the lineup. Um, both. Yeah, Kelly no, the scratched. other guy I asked about was Comtois. Oh, Comtois, yeah, good. sorry. Comtois, uh, surgery on his right hand. Yeah, he should be back soon. I think I don't know if he's back playing H- A- AHL games uh, yet. Let's see. Um, AHL, San Diego Gulls, stats. I don't think Comtois is back rehabbing yet, but uh, it's got to be soon, six weeks from October. It's It's got to be any day now. I haven't heard any updates about it, uh, but it looks like – oh, Brent Gates Jr. is up. Um yeah, I don't see any games played for Comtois, so he's probably still recovering. I mean, I, I, without any insider information, I would think he'd be back by uh, early January. But, who, I mean, you never know. With the way that things are going with the Ducks right now, and they've got that long Olympic break coming, maybe they're just going to keep him out, let him rest up, and bring him back full strength for uh, that final playoff push. But that is a good question. No, that's true. Yeah, because if you can bring those guys back in, if Steele's not playing up, you're just going to sub in a Comtois, you're going to sub in a Mac Jones, and then not a Mac Jones, a Max Jones. <laughs> Mac Jones, <laughs> there we go. Mac Jones, and Mac Jones could probably do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, see what they can do there. Um, and then you have Henrique, who, yeah, he's always been one of those weird players in hockey where it's like, He's had some years where he's really been able to score like a few years ago for the Ducks where you guys told him to shoot the puck more. And he had the, what was it, like 27 goals or whatever the hell, like the 30 goal. Like the season yeah, he just close. had yeah. ridiculous like breakout goal scoring campaign. Uh, and then he's always been a solid when he bought into being on the both sides of the ice. But he's just been so inconsistent in tides in his career that he's one of those weird guys. But if he's playing like he is this year, he's a very nice piece to have on your team that's for sure yeah you um just updating so the ducks tweeted two hours ago that comtois is super close to returning uh and there's a picture of him practicing so i think he i mean he's got to be back any day now maybe he's not even going to play any conditioning stints in the ahl i mean what i um, was i think he was the one i want to say that i saw the video online that he was playing in a california it was like two years ago so a california roller hockey league 
yeah with like a bunch of people like deking through them and like so, yeah. I, so and i just thought that was hilarious where one it shows like how much you're dedicated to just like working on stuff and playing and messing around and dedicated to the fans off the ice um but like two it's just it just shows how fun your personality is where that was a fun video to watch that involved him yeah, I think regardless of whether he is the player that had 33 points or, or better last season or if he's the guy that's going to be more of a, a second, third line uh, he guy, he's a leader. I mean, he, he's been notorious, not notorious isn't the right word, well known uh, in lower levels as, as being a good leader for his team. And I think he's an important guy to have either way. And just talking about all these young guys that are coming back from injury and that are out of the lineup right now, if the Ducks are still competitive come come the trade deadline, I mean, you never know what, what Solomon is going to do uh, to try to get in there. I mean, you have you still have guys like McTavish and Perot and Tracy, uh, Perot and Tracy are in the AHL. They could crack the lineup sometime this year or early next year. So you've got so many young players besides the ones that are already producing and the ones that are out injured that you have, a, 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 a I think, a pretty good amount of young players to, to put a good trade package for together. Uh, if there's someone, especially if there's a player who's like got a few years left on his contract, like you said, not so much a rental player come the trade deadline. So the Ducks are setting themselves up for a, a really interesting. I think Gallagher has a couple of years left on his contract. That's just oh, a yeah. name. Throw that out would, out there. He would be great. I mean, he, uh, Bob Murray rightfully is no longer the GM of the Anaheim Ducks. He got fired, but he, he's a guy that, that I'm sure uh, Murray loved. And I don't know what the analytics are like for Gallagher, but he, he's a, such a, a gritty, uh, not afraid to do the dirty work player, but offensively talented. He, I think he would fit in well with the Ducks. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Brandon Gallagher is one of those players that would fit in well with all 32 teams in the NHL just because of the way he plays the game and has that infectious, like, oh, that guy's running through a brick wall. Now I'm going to run through a brick wall for it. And then it just spreads throughout the the he rest. And, um, he and Deloria that, would be a great, I mean, if you could come not on the same line, cause they're, they're two different players, but if you had both of them on your roster, the ducks would be both offensively skilled and formidable in terms of uh, your grittiness you and your, and your true. violence. Yeah, plus you have Manson on defense who ain't afraid to um, – he's a big dude that's not afraid to go up and square anybody if you're going to mess with uh, his team either. So, yeah, I, I think that that makes sense if they're able to go out and get somebody like that. And I feel like they probably will if they're going to be in this good of a spot continuing because you might as well um, if you have that good of young talent. Uh, plus, if you move on from people, you have other guys coming up because you're only going to move like one or two guys in a trade and you – Named like Perot, Tracy, um, you you have um even uh Grulo or Gru. How do you say that guy's name? Oliver Gru. Benoit. Benoit Gru. Olivier yeah. Gru. <laughs> Gru. Yeah, I always mispronounce his name. Like you have him, so you have guys. If you trade people out, you still have other people coming down, and that's why it's always good to um be able to have that. Plus, you still have Goulet and uh, Drew as defensemen. Um, if injuries still uh, harp your defense a little bit since Mahara is out right now. So you're not going to be able to use him, but uh, like there's, there's a lot of good success things for the team. And I think it was maybe looking at it now, it's like a hindsight is 2020 thing. But when you look at the roster and how much good young talent they have, maybe we all underestimate, not that we thought they would be first in the Pacific division at this point, but underestimated where they actually could have been um, at this point coming into this season and that's it's just great to see how they're performing. But if you had any closing thoughts, Dele, I really appreciate you for joining. Hope to have you on again sometime to catch up on the Ducks. But uh, if you had any closing points of where people can uh, catch you at, uh, you can say that now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Deli Tweets. It's D-E-L-L-I-T-W-E-E-T-S. And I am a rotating co-host of the Totally Offsides podcast uh, about the Anaheim Ducks. We're on a little bit of a, a holiday break, but I'm on there a couple times a month. Uh, you can find us on all the po uh, podcast platforms. And then I think once the new year gets going, I'll probably be out covering some high school basketball and, and maybe some baseball in Southern California for uh, the Southern California News Group and, and for the LA Times Community News. So uh, if you see my name over there, uh, please come say hi. <laughs> It'll be fun. Uh, but thanks a ton for having me, man. It, it's been fun catching up and, and talking ducks. It's been fun. Yeah, it's definitely been fun. It's always fun to talk about a team that's ahead of the tie because it's all the positives and you don't have to talk about any of the negatives as much when it's a team that's ahead of the rebuild. Um, and I think this is a team ducks fans 
you know, to continue to have a competitive team all season, you have one of the most fun players to watch in the league and Trevor Zegra. So continue to have great success and fun watching your season. Uh, special thanks to Delhi for joining us. I'm Joe Borg. You can follow me at JJ Borg 26 over on Twitter and also check stuff out on Flyers Nitty Gritty where I write some articles and Steel Flyers is where I do a couple of the podcasts like the JB and Steel All Sports Show. This has been the Sports Fanatic News hockey show where we dove into the Anaheim Ducks and their success of being hot as a firecracker this season and why that is the case. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and enjoy the hockey.